Grand Rising, I'm Ron Usha and welcome to Conversations on the Spiritual Journey. Today I'm speaking with Renee. Grand Rising, Renee. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> and how are you today? I am very well. Um, in fact, today, earlier I was talking with a friend and she's like, you are very giggly today. Today is a good day for you. And I'm like, yes, it is a good day. <laughs> so you might find that, that I, I laugh a lot through this interview. Ah. <laughs> I think laughter is one of the great uh, means of uh, meditation and, and spiritual practice. It is, being able to find the joy, right? Yes. Yeah. Renee sent me a bio, so I'll read it out. Renee Rampasar Singh is the founder of Anugraha Yoga in Trinidad and Tobago. She has been learning and practicing yoga for 25 years and teaching since 2014. Most recently, she received certification in accessible yoga as a yoga for all teacher. While she teaches to all levels, she is especially drawn to working with seniors or those with injuries or other challenges. Renee, 25 years. So when did, when did you start your practice? Um, so, you know, it's always an interesting thing to talk about this. Um, officially, I would say, when I was 11, 10, 11, just before my 11th birthday, um, my mom had started doing meditation and yoga, and she started taking my brother and I along with her, as is the way of moms, right? <laughs> so our practice then would have begun around that age, officially. But growing up in a household, um, you know, my mom, somewhat Hindu, not, not fully Hindu, um, but most of the philosophy of yoga and the essence of the spirituality of it is already built into your daily life growing up. And um, so it's only as you get older and you go more into the practice of it that you recognize, well, it's been a part of your life for the whole life. But if you have to specifically say, well, okay, I guess I started a yoga practice. It would have been around the age of 11. So were you practicing with your mum? Was she taking you through the move? Yes. yes. Uh, we both attend, well, all three of us, um, attend the Blue Star, and that is an ashram in Claxton Bay, Trinidad and Tobago. And there are now centers throughout, throughout the world that have Blue Star members. And they do ash um, yoga and meditation, but also holistic therapy, that kind of thing. So they a wide range of therapy as well as yoga and meditation as its beast. I know there are many forms of yoga so what exactly is the form of yoga that you practice? <laughs> uh, I would say just yoga. So my guru himself he is Siddha Yoga and that is more with uh, I guess the ancient practice and meditation and history that kind of thing. The um, the essence of the masters, the teachings brought down, right? Uh, when we think about yoga, I know that people say, well, there are so many different types, but, you know, Hatha yoga is the physical, more of the physical practice. Kundalini, we do Kriya and that kind of thing. Gyan yoga, we do yoga of knowledge. And we, I think everyone in some way who is a, a yoga practitioner is doing some form of multi multiple forms of it. Simply because, you know, bhakti, bhakti being devotion, that is, that is a deep part of my own practice. So to specifically say that I practice like one type of, one type of yoga or one form of yoga, it's very hard to, to pinpoint because it crosses, you know, it's all, it's all interwoven <laughs> into my life. Did you always have the emphasis of the spiritual practice as well as the physical practice? Yes, and I would say that is more where we started from, um, connecting to the spirituality of it before becoming aware of how well working with the body can help us to further develop, before working with mental practice, before working with that, there's the underlying spirituality and the teaching and the knowledge that has come down from our ancestors and from, from those around us. So, yes. <laughs> Yeah, because I wrote that down that is for you, yoga is, 
is more than just a physical practice. Because I remember when a few years ago, I was looking for a yoga that was more looking into being more than just the actual physical movements. So how important is that? Yeah, so I think that um, considering yoga as a physical practice is more of a, how it has changed and how it has, I guess, um, been looked at from a Western perspective. Because if we go back to the heart of it, it is more, you know, how we live our lives, how we interact, how we relate, how we treat with others and ourselves before it is working with the body. So when we think about yoga, and, and I have this with people who come to me as new students, when we think about yoga as a, a physical practice, that is just one aspect of it, right? Um, and so for me, that has never been, it's only now uh, as I got my teacher training outside of Trinidad, as I uh, interact with more yoga instructors that I recognize that persons are looking at it as a physical practice, and then there is more. But the physical practice for me has, you know, that is what came after. <laughs> that is what came later on. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes. <laughs> So there's a, it all comes from this state of being first, of re recognizing, I guess, who we are. Some yeah. might say God or consciousness or awareness. God or consciousness or spirit or divinity or a spark or all of that. Yes, you know, just recognizing that, that inherent connection that we are all one in some way or the other. Yeah. So from the concept of the knowing that uh, we are all one how does that actually infuse into the actual practice itself how does that infuse into the practice i think um when we think about the fact that we are all connected then we can connect deeper with the philosophy presented to us through yoga right um that you know how we treat with others how we think about nonviolence, how we think about truthfulness, how we think about all these, the ethical aspects of it. Because when we think of ourselves as just being part of something and not, not, not an individual, an individual going about itself, then we can more deeply seat ourselves in knowing that we are supported, um, whether we think of it as support or not, but we are held by the greater the greater spirit or consciousness or whatever, right? So that no matter what we do, there's also that, there's always that essence of, of grace or of support or of faith. It's the, um, that is there that, you know, we're not isolated, we're not alone. And I think, especially during now in this pandemic, um, like for me, yoga has been a way to to recognize that yes, I might be home alone or home with my partner in our little bubble, but we are still connected. I can still reach my students, not just not just through the internet, not just virtually, but I can sit in my meditation and bring them to mind. I can sit in my space and bring them into my heart and we are connected in that way. So it, for me, it's always been that uh, interconnectedness that, you know, we are one. I think something extraordinary happens when you're in a room practicing yoga or meditation in a group of people that something seems to drop, you know, just self of I'm doing this and it's possible to just feel that you're more than just this body, especially in a group. Group energy, yes. I fully believe in group energy having experienced it myself, right? I told you we grew up um, attending ashram, which attending satsang, attending morning meditation, attending. I mean, even all now we attend satsang, although it is virtual. So we can still find that group energy. And I've always thought of it personally as um, when I was growing up, we learned about osmosis. You know, osmosis, I don't know how science we are, but of how if things come into a thing, if you are a higher level and you're, if there's one that is higher and one is lower, we try to bring things into balance, right? And for me, like when we when I go into a group space, it's always that amplification of that. That if we are feeling low, we are brought up by those who are there sharing in that space. 
And if we are high, then we don't come down, but we help to, to bring things into balance, right? So it's always been that, that way, that group energy helps to support because we're now in, I guess, a closer environment. We're all there with a common intent. Do you find that sometimes when this happens, the teacher-student paradigm can fall away and you're all just in this group um, playing with it or practicing it? I mean, yes, I suppose so. <laughs> yes, um, and, and the teacher-student, teacher my, my own guru, he's always said, you know, he is with us and he, not physically there, but that the energy that he is trying to all to lift us in that way, right? And with myself, with my own students, um, there is so much that they know, you know, every one of us being individuals have our own share of experiences and our knowledge. And when we come together, we bring that into it, you know, so that we all Yes, I might be teacher, they might be student, but there's much that they can teach me just as there's much that I know my guru has shared, you know, that we lift him even as much as he lifts us. So there's that. <laughs> yes, because we are always learning, aren't we? Um, yeah. From another, and it could be from um, from nature. I think you, re you talked about nature in your, in your meditations from other yeah. people. Yeah, so in terms of nature, um, when we think about ourselves as connected, we are here on this planet as people, but if we go beyond physical appearance, we are here on this planet with other forms of energy, other forms of energy in form of trees, in forms of plants, in forms of, you know, the animals, all of these kinds of things. And in the same way that we as humans have our own experiences, they have their own experiences and their own knowledge and their own wisdom to share. And, you know, as a person who is practicing yoga, I know that each of us has our own way that we will connect to, to source or to spirit, right? So that, um, like, there are people who will connect more physically and they will do a physical practice. There are people who will connect more um, by being in nature and resonating with those around, right? So, yeah, <laughs> being in nature is just part of being here in this space. Yes, because um, I've always felt that um, meditation is not what you do, it's who you are. So it can be done whether you're walking, uh, washing the dishes, it could be done anywhere. It doesn't have to be um, sat down in a hall somewhere. Agree to an extent, um, just that we can get into a meditative space by doing, by repeating, by uh, practicing and, and becoming and bringing in that awareness of what we're doing and how we're doing and what's happening in that moment, right? Um, but for us to get into, I think, if we're think, looking at the goal of yoga, moving into liberation, moving into transformation, moving into enlightenment, then I feel then you would need to to come into that space on your mat or in your bed or wherever wherever you can can pause and be because then even though you can come into a meditative state while while doing whatever draws your attention if you go beyond that then you turn inwards to a deeper level then you really begin to pay attention and so I feel that there are multiple and I feel I don't know enough about you know like speaking about meditation to talk to the different tombs that they have for it the different levels of awareness but that for you to come into that seat to move towards um moksha enlightenment that kind of thing um that you would need to settle beyond just being in a meditative space do you does it make sense Yes. <laughs> so what is this uh, liberation or, or what they call enlightenment? What is this? I feel like everyone would have their own uh, definition based on their own experience. <laughs> um, and I feel that um, it's a very personal thing to discover, right? 
for myself. Like I would not say that I'm fully enlightened. I will not say I'm fully liberated. I know I have my own um, faults and discomfort and all these kinds of things, right? But I work towards clearing, clearing and becoming more, more of myself, uh, clearing and becoming closer to my own truth. Um, because I, I know um, that I have these little things that I need to work through, right? And so for me, uh, liberation has always been that, that bringing ourselves into that purer state of being, um, not necessarily fully through meditation, but you know, beginning to use the tools and the practices that we are given to work through what we need to work through. <laughs> and we all have our own experiences, our own past uh, karma, past work that will tie us up. And it is for us to recognize and to acknowledge um, what we need to work through before we can get there. What for you does karma mean? Karma for me, uh, well, it's the result of past action, but it's also the action that we do, right? Um, so whatever we create and we work towards, we are creating that, that karma, that action. Um, and whatever we, whatever comes to us based on things that we have done, whether in this, so I fully believe in reincarnation, there are those who don't, but, um, you know, whatever has come to us based on actions that we have done or made or shifted, <laughs> this is what it, yeah. I never think of it as a bad thing because I feel like it's always, um, it's always made on our own choice, right? Karma is the result of what we have chosen to do. So we work with it. So with this practice, can it, I've, all, I've always thought that it can, you know, maybe we have a lot of ancestral trauma in our bodies and energy fields as well. And just to recognize that is a healing. Yeah, um, there is healing in working through and working through our practices. Um, and yes, I fully believe we have all these, especially, you know, trying to add <laughs> wherever, wherever we are, but especially um, those of us who have faced colonization and who have come from different spaces and who have, I mean, you know, Trinidad is a, a melting pot of many different cultures brought here because of colonization. Um, and so there are many things that would have caused trauma, right? And that lasts in our body in as much, and I feel, you know, this is partly why I believe in, in reincarnation, that we carry with us uh, down through our DNA, all of these things that happen to us. And in healing, so if you do Reiki, if you do yoga, if you do meditation, you can reflect and heal, not just yourself and, and what has come to you, but you can reflect on, like I've been doing a lot of work thinking about my parents, thinking about my grandparents and what they would have gone through and accepting what may have resulted from that and noticing what we have learned and just even um, building a sense of gratitude for what their experience was and how they have moved forward, right? So yes, I fully believe that um, healing can come and that we can go back and that we can go forward, you know, in the thing. Because I think as well, in this healing, if we come from, we are not just these physical bodies, it has such an effect on, it has to affect others if we are healing ourselves, especially from a lots of a uh, deep rooted trauma. It does, especially if we, yes, when we think that we are not the body, um, that we are the energy inherent, that we are spirit, that we are all connected then yes, any healing work that we ourselves do resonates and ripples outward, resonates and ripples backward into the space, resonates and ripples forward. I think about, I don't have kids yet and I, I don't know if I want to, but if, you know, whatever comes from me, I will already, I'm already thinking, may they be safe. 
may they be sound, may they have this knowledge, may they have this wisdom, you know, that kind of thing. So I believe that any practice we do can be healing, not just for ourselves, but for our wider family and then community and then society. <laughs> so I feel, you know, when we all come together, there's much power. And I guess in meditation, meditation is happening now, no matter where you are, it's happening. So if you're in Trinidad and you're meditating, there in a sense, there is meditation and whatever healing or cleansing that somebody does somewhere else, it has to affect the, the wider world. It does. And that's always been something that has been a great comfort to me, that thought that, you know, if we go into meditation in our own space, we can connect um, with those around the world. So, you know, I, I don't know if you know, uh, that they do these peace waves for the International Day of Peace, where you pause at midday, wherever you are, and you, you meditate, right? And they do it different uh, times of the year, that kind of thing. I know for yoga day, they'll probably be doing a next one, that kind of thing. But it's always creating that ripple that at any point you can stop and wherever you are, you can connect to someone who is meditating in whatever way or form, because so many cultures, so many religions, so many whatever, believe in meditation and contemplation and, and coming into that space. So it's not just even that you have to, that you can connect with persons who are all oh, yoga instructors or yoga people, but just, <laughs> you know. Again, being a Trini, I have in my family Catholics and Presbyterians and Muslims, and <laughs> that we're all connected, right? Mm. Um, and I feel maybe that that has given given me this wider perspective as well that we can all come together on different levels. That no matter what religion we ascribe to or whatever um, culture we belong to, we can still connect because the essence of it is there. Yeah, because uh, consciousness has no division or religion or divisive aspects to it. It just is. So these outward manifestations of different religions don't really, they're not part of what consciousness is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we are connected to whatever you believe or whatever you think. Uh, um, coming to meditation, we are together in this. Exactly. Um, you know, that there is that deeper connection and that what we, um, we create our differences by seeing ourselves as other, by seeing ourselves as individuals, by seeing ourselves as brown deal somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but, and the heart of it, and, and this is where when in our yoga practice, we can ask ourselves, what is our truth? Or what is our what do we bring it down to? What do we boil down to? And it's at the heart of it, we're all connected. We're all spirit, we're all consciousness, we're all divine sparks, that kind of thing. And you spoke of um, gratitude. Yeah. I think there's such a healing power in that because we all go through some, some more traumatic things than others, but being able to see something in that, a lesson in that, gratitude in that, which is maybe not always very easy, there's something profound that can come through that. There is. Gratitude is, is this one of the strongest practices that I know of. Um, so my mom, and part of how I ended up being a yoga instructor, my mom went through, she passed away in 2013, but prior to that, she had 17 years of living with breast cancer. And that is, you know, breast cancer, cancer, any cancer, is not great for the body, right? It's not great for the body. Um, and she went through periods of remission and recurrence, that kind of thing. But through it all, I've always thought that it was, and I know that it was her yoga practice that kept her strong, not in necessarily in body, but in spirit, in mind, in heart, right? And always she would be grateful. Um, she's like, not even that you know, it's hard to be grateful, I feel like when we're put in a circumstance where everything is falling down on you, even your own body. But she's perhaps one of the greatest examples of that for me. And that she was like, you know, I am grateful that I have this cancer and that you don't. I am grateful if I get this cancer again and my sister doesn't. 
I am grateful if I have my cancer and whoever is related, you know, the relations that I can take this on myself and I work with it because I am able to handle it, you know? And that for me was, um, and that is what has triggered and has helped me think about gratitude in a way. You know, how can we be grateful for something that is so wearing, you know, if you've been with someone who is unwell, that's so wearing on your physical body, wearing on your spirit, wearing on, you, you don't want to be in that situation, but still find that gratitude just for being able to see another day, being able to experience, being able to connect, being able to, you know, and so giving that gratitude and feeling it fully is, I think, um, a practice that I will always be working on in myself. Yes, because it's an um, ongoing practice, isn't it? It keeps on going. It's not like yeah. you reach it and it's finished. It's yeah. an ongoing, ongoing movement. It is. Just as with our yoga practice, it is not, oh, we, we have achieved X. It is not that, it is an ongoing learning. It is an ongoing discipline. It is an ongoing practice of becoming aware of how you are, what's going on. And, and even if I feel that, oh, I have achieved, I have done this. It is to feel gratitude for the fact that yes, I have achieved, I have done this, <laughs> right? And to know that now there's another level that I can reach. Now there's another state of being that I can tap into. Now that there's another, uh, fullness that I can reach. There's a saying by his teacher, uh, Rupert Spira, and he says, once the journey to God ends, the journey in God begins. <laughs> and I think that's, that's such a profound um, statement, because often I think, especially for me here in the beginning, it was like you try to reach this, but then you realize that's just the beginning. Now the journey in it really starts. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, we can strive and we can work towards attaining that, whatever we have in mind as that, <laughs> God, spirit, liberation, whatever. But then it is to, we are here on this, on this planet. Are we going to, when we have attained that, what are we doing then? Are we, how do we maintain that level of being? How do we, continue working with ourselves? How do we be in this space, even while being with God, being with spirit, being with, you know? So for me, it will always be a, a continuous practice. What do you think about, because um, we hear of some teachers who attain liberation and they sit with that. And there are others who want to do some kind of activism in their lives, they may see things they like to change outwardly. I think that each person has their own calling and that when we reach to, again, a state where we have looked through our, our knots, our trials, our tribulations, our closed way of thinking, whatever, when we have worked through that, um, then we can come to the, tr the truth of what we're doing here. <laughs> on this planet at this point in time in this moment what am I called to do right and this is not something that is for the masters alone or for the enlightened teachers whoever it is for all of us to because they are they are examples of how we want to live our lives right so it is for us to notice um what their calling is and how they how they connect with it and then to ask ourselves what is our calling what is my calling what is my truth and coming back to it so I think of them as examples because um, for some of us we will need to hold the space uh, you know for those teachers who achieve a state of enlightenment and then stay and then uh, sit in that space that is fine that is what they're meant to do to sit in that space and build and hold that level of consciousness, that level of energy. For those who move into activism, who find a calling that they are pursuing with their heart, then that is what they are meant to do. That if, if that is what they are meant, then it will happen, you know, <laughs> that is their karma. 
And I think that allows for what, what to see that what consciousness is expressing through you is unique. It's your, it's your inner goal, which no one else can. It's not for anyone else. You have a particular path through you. You are unique in this particular mind body. Yes. You know, we come in to this being this space with our own uh, colorings. And so coloring shades of being, right? With each of us having that individual way to express ourselves. And so when we can come to our truth, we can fully express ourselves in whatever way that takes, right? And when you look at it that way, it kind of seems that it, it, it from the realities that each one is, is then extraordinary in their own being. Yes. And once the recognition of that take place, I guess what's allowed is for you to fruitfully just express yourself. Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, it comes with work, right? It comes with the practice that you have to, you know, um, there is a difference between thinking, oh, I am amazing uh, without doing the work that makes you amazing, right? So there's that practice that, you know, we are individual spots. We all, all have our thing to express our own truth. But we have to work towards finding that clarity of how do I express? What do I express? How, how does it serve? You know? But yeah. I guess from there, we can get past a lot of the things that hold us back, which is this is this is this is right this is wrong i'm good or i'm bad and just be with yourself in that particular moment what's being expressed through here is here and it's present yes um and i think that once we have done the practices you know yoga provides so i feel each of us needs to find our base so for me yoga is my base uh it provides the ethical the philosophy that i base my, my morals, my values on, right? And so I feel like we all need to have that base before we can fully express ourselves. Because if we do so, if we just express without knowing what is our core truth, without knowing what is our philosophy, without knowing what values we uphold or we want to bring through, then we can cause severe harm, um, you know, by not being true and not being connected, not, not having that grounding. In that sense, it's quite extraordinary that we can live so many years without asking the question of who am I? What is my <laughs> core truth? What is my being? Because that's probably the, the first question to ask of yourself, uh, just as uh, living in these bodies as, as human beings. Yeah, it is. Who am I is the never ending deepest question that we can that we can connect to who am I what am I in this space for why what's going on <laughs> all of that who am I yeah um I understand though if persons don't want to and I understand if persons don't see the need um because we can get caught up in everyday life we can get caught up in the fact that oh I have to do xyz I have to work to make a living. I have to take care of my family. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to, and you can get so caught up in doing and in just being in the world that you don't take the time to reflect on your inner space. You don't take the time to recognize, but why? Why am I doing? Why am I working? Why am I having, right? Um, and so, yes, who am I is one of the questions that I feel everyone should ask themselves and that is the base of what we're doing yeah but i understand completely if it takes time uh a lifetime <laughs> for people to reach that question or if it takes time and if even for persons to ask themselves a question then be um frightened be you know uncomfortable with the what they find with what they find, right? Based on what beliefs they might have, might have held or what knowledge they have or what culture they're brought up into. If people ask themselves, who am I? 
and they don't like what they find and then they don't dig deeper, you know, then you're just, <laughs> but as a, a yoga practitioner, it is, I feel it is our call to first examine yourself and to work on yourself before you can, or while you, you know, to be a, a good teacher, to be a good practitioner, to be, and what is good, right? But to be and express yourself fully, you have to do the inner work. And with that is the, I guess, the honesty and authenticity that you come with. Because I guess um, you're going to find many things that you thought or you know, that, that you've buried underneath. Yeah, it can be very uh, traumatic just to <laughs> dig through the layers of being, right? And that is why um, persons will seek for a guide, persons will seek for a teacher, persons will seek for a guru, person will seek for a priest, person will seek for, right? Because they want someone who has been there before and who can provide guidance, right? And so in terms of yoga in today, present day, um, I feel that there are lots of teachers who just become teachers. You know, you do a 200 hour teacher training. That is not enough if you want to be a full yoga teacher right? um, because you have to have that own you have to dig deep and find the work within yourself right to be able to support and to guide those who are looking to you as a teacher so and i think that i've been very lucky in having good teachers um, and having even just uh that guru aspect perspective teaching because I know that in the Western world, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about gurus and what that means and all of these people have done bad things. But when you get to the heart of what is a guru and how that relationship develops, you can find that, you know, were they really gurus? How did you make them that? What, what is that connection? Because my own, my own teacher, he will be like, go and do the work. Don't listen to me. I can tell you this, but you need to discover it in yourself. You know, and that is the relationship, that is the thing. And, and if it is that I am beating myself up, he will tell me. And if it is that I am lifting myself up too much without taking the time to look back, he will tell me as well. <laughs> so, so it's never been uh, for me a relationship of just like, oh, master, oh, whatever. It's always been a two-way kind of thing. And it's always been work on myself before anything else. <laughs> so. I guess that teachers can give pointings, but you have to do the work yourself. You have to do the work yourself. Yoga is at heart a very personal practice because it is you. Um, I was watching one of your videos and you spoke of uh, the dark nights of the soul. Yes. <laughs> you please explain what that means to you. Good. To me, you know, the first time I heard about Dark Night of the Soul is because I like to read a lot. I really love fantasy and science fiction, which is, <laughs> which I suppose fits in. Uh, I know people don't, but when you think about writing it, you know, people have to go through, as a reader, you want to know that these books, they have that arc, right, of development. And in myself, in reading certain books, you notice how they write it, like the, the character, the hero, the heroine, whatever, they have to have that moment of transformation. And that comes for all of us because what is written is only an expression of what is inside and what people are thinking of and what people are feeling. And so for me, Dark Knight of the Soul has always been about when you fall and not physically fall, but when you get so caught up that you're so sorrowful or so angry or so hurt or so all of these things. And then you have to, or not have to, but then you experience um, that moment of either grace, of awakening, or faith or trust, which comes after you have gone to the very bottom of being, after you recognize all of this uh, <laughs> crap about yourself. Um, 
that then you can recognize that, oh, well, you are held and that you can come out of it, that there is some way that you can take all of this gunk and transform it, that you can take all of this that is in you and, you know, come out of it, that you can work with it, that you can evolve beyond it, that you can continue going. Yeah. <laughs> So it's always a peak, right? You go down and then you come back up. Dark nights. <laughs> I've also found that when you maybe uncover certain traumas or things that you feel, that that's just the top layer. Underneath it is so much more. So you think maybe you've had a major breakthrough and the next day, wham, something happens. And that makes you aware of thoughts and feelings that maybe you didn't even know, but have been buried deep down. Have you found yeah. it in your case or with people you've worked with? Yeah, I mean, that is, that is the way of it. You, you find something in yourself you do not like, or something makes itself known that someone does not like about you. And then that can shift you. That can be a wake up call to be like, oh, why, why is this? What is this? And when you start to explore the why, the what of it, and you go down deeper and you'd be like, oh, what is this? And then you go down deeper and it's like, oh no, what is this? <laughs> because you can spiral down <laughs> into the, the depths of, of all that there is. But just as you can spiral down, you know, when you have that support, when you have that group energy, when you remember that we are all connected, you know that you can, that even at the very bottom, you are still held, you are still uh, part of the infinite, you are still um, a child of God, whatever you want to call it, right? So even at your lowest, at your darkest, at your deepest, you're still treasured. And so you can come up out of it um, just with that, that <laughs> recognition. Because yes, and a lot of um, spiritual work and healing work will take you down, take you down into how, how deep you can go, how dark, how gloomy and depressed and all of these things. Um, but you know, there are also ways to bring you back up. And I feel that a lot of, especially during this time, you know, a lot of teachers need to focus on that, on figuring out how to provide that support to bring people out of, um, or to let people know that they are supported so that they can come out of their spiral. <laughs> and also, I guess we can look at it another way, that spiraling down and we use the word darkness, is darkness, I guess, into the void, into nothingness. So you're actually, you're actually moving towards who you really are. Yes. Yeah. And that, isn't it fascinating? <laughs> it is fascinating, right? Um, what do we think of as darkness? What do we think of as despair? What do we think of as depression? What do we think of as our our deepest, darkest, gloomiest, whatever. And why do we think of it as that when it can be the most transforming moment, right? When it can be that recognition of, oh, this is, this is it. This is what I am. This is who I am, right? Um, and so it's always interesting to hear what people think about darkness because, <laughs> because we need to, just as there is day, there is night, you know? We need to have that balance. We need to go into sometimes that darkness and rest in that space. We need to go into that darkness and see what is hidden, see what is there. And know that in as much as there is dark, there is light. There is that balance. Where is it? You know? I read a quote by somebody and it was, I can't remember who now, isn't about changing our perception of what darkness is because they said, it's the soil, the darkness of the soil where the plants grow. It's the womb where the darkness of the womb where the child is born. Yeah. It's the darkness of the night sky where you can see the stars. That is beautiful. But yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. 
Because I guess in that nothingness is it's where everything is born from. Yeah, cosmic void. <laughs> yeah, that there is that. It is in the nothingness that there is everything. That there is the fullness of being. You have a program called the Yamas and the Niyamas. Could you explain what that is, please? I have a program. <laughs> I have videos on yeah, YouTube. Video, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and those are just, that is an exploration of the yamas and the niyamas. And the yamas and the niyamas are the first and second limbs of yoga. And they form the part of the form, so it's part of the ethical basis that we live our lives by, right? The yamas teaching us how we work with ourselves, how we treat with ourselves, and the niyamas, how we treat with others. And that I did. I believe last year during lockdown, and it is a continuous process. So I feel, again, I go back to it year, year after year in my own way to explore what I think of it, right? And that's, so those videos that I did uh, was an exploration for me of, of um, looking at each yama, looking at each niyama, and how they work in the world. And it was also based on the teachings of um, Deborah Adele, I believe. Yeah, so she's written a book on the yamas and the niyamas, the ethical foundations. But for yoga and a practitioner, you need to do as I have done and reflect on it year to year, moment to moment, because I did that last year. And I think now I have a deeper understanding of it this year, in this moment, right? So it is, let us think about ahimsa, the first yama, the first one, nonviolence. And there is so much that has happened in the world between last year and this year. So many experiences, so many things that have uh, come into our space, whether good or bad or in between, right? And so in experiencing these things and asking ourselves, well, how does Ahimsa really come into play for me um, in terms of nonviolence? How do I look at it as I go into the world? How do I look at it? And right now, we're in this pandemic, Trinidad, as I, I said to you, I think before before we started, Trinidad and Tobago has gone into another period of lockdown. And Ahimsa, when we think of nonviolence, can be shown in how people respect others, um, respect the fact that, you know, we can't or we should not be circulating, that we can't um, move around as freely that we need to consider those who are um, without jobs, without the comforts that they have, that we need to consider what has what this time means for everyone, right? Um, so when we think about nonviolence, it's not just physical nonviolence, right? It's it's on every level, um, mental, emotional community, society, family even. I had a, a big thing happen with me and my brother because he did not want to take the vaccine and I am all for the vaccine, right? Um, but when we both look at it, you know, it's, it's respecting, being able to understand the other person's viewpoint and how, you know, and respecting what their wishes are in terms of taking in foreign substances into their body, or protecting themselves against being, you know, whatever. But it is in every interaction looking at what does nonviolence mean? And that is just one of the yamas, right? So it gives you many different layers of thinking or being aware of how you operate um, in the world and how you think. And when we look at the yamas and the niyamas, they help to keep us grounded. Um, and also come back to our truth and be fully aware of how we are, what we are. And so we spoke about dark night of the soul. I feel that when we build our practices, when we think about things like the yamas and the niyamas, which is just one part, one, one part of the philosophy of yoga, right? We begin to give ourselves the tools that we need so that if we sink all the way down, we can come back up. Or that when we sink all the way down, we recognize, oh, it's not so bad a place to be, <laughs> you know? 
we give ourselves this grounding because that is what it is. Um, being able to look at how we feel, how we think, how we are in those moments. That's what the yamas and the niyamas feel like. It gives us that grounding. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot to talk about in a thing, right? And when you spoke and you spoke of the nonviolence, I also thought of the nonviolence against ourselves with our own thoughts of how we harm ourselves and the things we say to ourselves. Yeah, it is. Oh, especially, especially how we think about ourselves, uh, what we see, what we find. Often we are our harshest critics, right? Um, I mean, I'm sure there are people who are like, yes, I am the bomb. But for a lot of us, <laughs> a lot more, I believe, you know, we are much uh, more inclined to, to beat ourselves up and to not see ourselves at our fullest and to not recognize, well, oh, you know, I, I did good on that. Or, you know, <laughs> I am able to do this. I am, I am amazing. Um, but yeah, nonviolence in all ways, um, especially, and as I said, yoga is a very personal practice. So before we can even look at how we treat with even my partner, I'm, I'm in a home with just my partner. So before you can even look at how you are with someone else, you have to look at how you are with yourself. <laughs> and that's what it, it is. There's a doctor, um, I think it was Inamoto, and he talked about how um, our words affect uh, the vibration of water. And if we see that the body is made up of this, what are we doing to ourselves? when we say these things about ourselves and how does that affect the cells and does that call injury and trauma in the body that we hold this continuously having to go at ourselves, telling ourselves we're not good enough. Yes, he's the one who did um, the experiments with the water in bottles and he- Yes. Yeah. So yes, I mean, we are, what are we, 70% water? Is that it, our bodies? <laughs> And yes, um, and I think that's why there's so much, I mean, there are affirmations in different cultures, there are mantras, there are all these positive speaking, positive thinking. And this is all to give us, you know, the tools because we can, we can speak, but when we think that is in us, right? That is in that space. So we have to look not just at what we put out, but what we, take in and what we um, reflect on within ourselves and know or figure out or ask how we can work on ourselves better because yes, um, negative self-talk is a thing and we need to work against that and build ourselves up instead of tearing ourselves down. And also, I guess what you said from before is that once it's known who we really are, just consciousness or spirit expressing in these bodies, then we don't even have to put positive or negative to it. We, that's what we are. And that is yeah. unique in itself. Yeah, and I, I said in the beginning, you know, uh, I had a call with my friend earlier and she was like, oh, you're so giggly. And I was like, yes, I feel very light, very happy. And it was because, you know, um, it's been a, a couple of weeks of, well, what's going on in Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, and so there's been a lot of heaviness in terms of finances and the economy and the health and the everything. But I've been taking time to just be with myself and recognize, you know, well, yeah, all of this is happening, but there's a reason I'm in this time and space and it's okay, I can handle it, I can do the things, I am able, I am functioning. <laughs> So, you know, it brings a certain lightness of spirit. It brings a certain level of joy when we bring ourselves back to our truth, to who we are. So when we, you know, when we connect with, okay, yeah, this is, this is me, I'm here, <laughs> you know, it helps to um, just release all of this uh, extra. Not that it is not um, still affecting us in any way, right? but just that we, it puts us in a better space to deal with what is around us, what's going on. And 
And laughter is infectious, isn't it? I mean, someone could be laughing and you don't know why they're laughing and someone else next to them will start laughing as well. I think there's something really extraordinary that happens with laughter, a kind of bonding, which happens automatically just by someone laughing. Yeah, laughing and smiling and being happy, you know. Um, it is a, a joyful experience. That is, that's the word that keeps coming to mind, joyful, right? It lifts your spirit, being joyful. And laughter, uh, if you're in a group, you know, one of the fondest things that you want to do is, is to have that lightness of being of spirit with those that you care about, with those that you love, or with those that even if you work with, even when you are in a situation with coworkers, if you can laugh about it, you can even it out. And let's go into, uh, I think what is called was Asva, Ashvara Prandana um, practice. Ashvara Pranidana. Pranidana. You said something which I really liked, and in that it was the dance of life. <laughs> okay. Could Good. you go into that, the I dance of life? I need to go watch my videos again. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did I say? This is amazing. Go ahead. What yeah. did you get from it? I think it was just what you, the point you were making, it was that um, just allow this, this life to happen and go with the flow with it. And then you can dance with the music, you can flow with it. And in that, there's a kind of freeing of yourself. Yeah, and I feel like it works straight off of our point about laughter, right? About living in that joy, living in that. When we come to the realization or when we decide to acknowledge and it is a choice, right? When we decide to acknowledge that, yes, we are part of something. We are part of something greater, something beyond. We are connected. Then we can say, well, yes, I have, I am um, part of this plea. I am part of this stance. And, you know, there are those who will say, oh, well, then is everything set in stone? And the answer is no. We are all expressing ourselves. But in how we express, we have our individual spark, our individual way of doing it. I am in this physical body at this physical time um, to be this kind of person and to have that energy of spirit expressing itself in this way, right? And that is what is needed. That is what is called for, right? Um, and that is the dance, that is the plea that in each moment, you know, when we express ourselves fully, when we are part of it, we go with the flow. We connect with what is around us. We become aware of, of being connected. And when we are connected, then, you know, we become part of that dance, right? I am, um, my husband and I have been during lockdown trying to have a very small garden space <laughs> in the space where we are living. And part of it that has been important for us is creating a space where nature can express itself fully, which means that I really wanted a passion fruit vine. I don't know, you know passion fruit, it's delicious. I really want this passion fruit vine. It started vining lovely, excellent. And then this very beautiful passion fruit butterfly, I think. It's orange, it's a specific butterfly came and laid its eggs on my passion fruit vine, hatched into these very black caterpillars that went from this tiny being to this tiny, this not, and ate down most of the leaves of my passion fruit vine. I was horrified. It was awful. It was awful. And then I was like, okay, they will become, they will become butterflies. I will have pollinators in my garden. And then some very lovely little birds who I've never seen before, but found my passion for vine because of these caterpillars. And so they ate the caterpillars and now they are they. And now my passion fruit vine is once more growing luxuriously, very lovely leaves and everything. But it is the dance, it is the play, right? That <laughs> we support nature in that way, that we are as well supported that, you know, we might think, well, okay, this is the intent, this is what's happening. But then we can say, okay, no, this is what 
And it is in coming back to our truth, to our essence, that we can notice what part we have to play in the dance of life, what part we have to play, or what role we can take, or what um, what elements of life we can express, you know, bring into the space. <laughs> yeah. And this moment here right now also is part of this uh, dance of life. Yeah, and that's why, that's why you know, when you, when you messaged, um, I said, yeah, I, I could do it because I can talk to people, it's fine. <laughs> and whoever it reaches, it reaches. And maybe whoever sees it, this is what they're meant to see in this time. And it will spark something or not, positive or negative, it's fine because I've been having fun in this conversation, and so it's been good. <laughs> and I think as well, you mentioned in one of your talks, I think, living in the unknown. And from yeah. there, you are open. From there, you are open. You have that trust. You have that. And it is hard, of course, to live in the unknown, too. And especially for some of us who are planners, right? And especially now in a pandemic, you cannot plan. You cannot anticipate, you cannot say, well, this is going to happen, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, in this order, in this way, you can't do that. Um, and then there are two ways to react to this. Do I, do I really go, because I cannot plan, or cannot organize, or cannot whatever, or do I say, okay, I accept, this cannot happen at this time, it is all unknown to me, but I trust that I am held. I trust that I am supported. I trust that I am here in this time and space for a reason. And whatever is going to happen, I'm going to do my best. I guess as well, that's the freedom of the spirit. I guess it's the mind, the conditioned mind that wants to know, wants to work it out, wants to see where you're going to go. But from this freeing, you can because we don't know what we're going to know. We don't know. So we don't know that this conversation connects with this person who meets this person over here, who connects with yeah. that person. Uh, we just don't know. And I think from that, it, you have then a magical feeling about life. Yeah. You know, we don't know a lot of things. Even we don't even know what we know. <laughs> 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 don't even know what we know until until like moments like these when we're speaking or moments when we're in community or moments when we're in the dark night when we come down to ourselves we don't know what's going to until we dig deep until we put ourselves in these experiences until we say okay i accept i will i will do this thing <laughs> I think sometimes you think of living in the unknown of this is just this, you know, uh, extraordinarily hard thing, but it's what we do every day anyway. We don't know what we're going to say in five minutes time. It's our natural state of being. Mm -hmm. It's true. <laughs> we don't know. We can't say for sure what's going to happen. Yeah. You said in your yoga practice that you're especially drawn to working with seniors or people with challenges why did you go on that route i am and that is partly because of my experience with my mom um as i said she had cancer for 17 years and i was the primary caretaker um yeah it was mostly i mean you are you have trini roots so you know we family bonds together like that right so we take care of our own in that way and so my family brother me my dad we all drew together and we took care of her, right? Um, and so in taking care, caretaking is a practice that will really bring you down into yourself. Um, there were a lot of emotions that came out of that, a lot of work, and that's all fine, but it made me realize that, you know, this is something that is needed, especially here in Trinidad, um, that we need persons to work with, those who are, unwell in this way or those who are seniors you know when we think about yoga practice here in Trinidad there are two two avenues um those who come to to the spiritual to the uh growing up with it and those who come through it through the western way through 
yoga studios and gyms and that kind of thing, right? And so there is that, that way um, of looking at what's going to, how things are supported because our seniors are left out. Our seniors are, you know, if they grow up going to temple, if they grow up learning um, yoga through their whatever, then maybe there is that spiritual support, there is that moral support, there is all this satsang, all that kind of way. But then there's no physical support, not so much. If they go to the gyms and stuff, then there is some physical support, but then not as much of the um, spiritual side, right? So for me, it's been working with those who are like as old as my own parents in their 60s, 70s, 80s. I've had a couple 90 year old. And it's recognizing for me that, you know, as we get older, it's just the body that gets older. And mentally, we pretty much think of ourselves as we were always, <laughs> you know, emotionally we mature in certain ways but we still have those needs of connection. We still have these needs, right? And so for me, working with seniors has been very rewarding um, and hopefully for them as well, you know, being able to, to have someone to share with and to look out for them and to keep them healthy in these, in these ways, right? Um, I've also done some work with palliative care and palliative care is relatively new in Trinidad, new as in like, the past 10, 12 years. That is that is new, right? Um, and so palliative care is something that I've also, that is why last year I did the accessible yoga training because I wanted to be able to do the yoga postures, but modify them so that my seniors could be able to do it. So that persons who are, um, who are in a situation where they can't get off their bed, they can still have practice you know, that kind of thing. So it is, I think, something that is very needed in different spheres, and especially here in Trinidad and Tobago, because I care deeply about, you know, my older relatives, my older circle. And so it is not just for me uh, looking at my family, but seeing, you know, what is in the wider community, how are we supporting our elders? Yeah. <laughs> I think what you're doing as well is a practice which is taught of in many of the scriptures and spiritual books is of being of service. Yeah, service. It's one of the ways, right? One of the ways that we come to ourselves. Um, and it's funny, when I was in my, I guess, early 20s, uh, I asked my guru, you know, well, what is my path? What am I supposed to be doing? How am I? Because as you see, you know, in the beginning, we spoke about how there are different ways, different practices. You have Gyan Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga is service and action, um, Hatha Yoga, work with the body, that kind of thing. And he said to me, you know, your path is mostly through service because that is who you are at your core. That is, you know, and it, at the time, I really didn't think so. <laughs> I really did not think so at all. <laughs> but based on um, my own experiences. And it's always amazed me that someone will say something and I'll be like, that is so not it. But years later, years later, on reflection of how without, without paying attention to that, but choosing what I want to choose to do um, and the experiences that I've had and where I've wanted to go, which did not necessarily coincide with where it was suggested that I go. <laughs> you know, I still ended up in this space where, yes, service. Right? And it makes much, much more sense to me now than it did, you know, 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. It's extraordinary how um, things work out, things that you may find the most challenging or difficult, you can be drawn to or the paths that you think that no way you could do, that's the thing that you do. Yes, exactly. And I think um, as teachers also, we are constant, you know, you teach and you learn, especially, especially if you call yourself a teacher of any kind. Both of my parents were secondary school teachers, right? So they, they, they taught in the local secondary schools. 
um, what you teach. And in teaching, you learn so much more and you receive in that way and you hone your skills in that way because you are constantly thinking about the subject that you're teaching and how to express it and if, if it is true. And so it is my hope that those who become yoga teachers now, um, that they do this as well, that they go beyond thinking about, well, I am just a, I'm a yoga teacher. I have, have gotten this, you know, now I can teach it is constant learning and constant reflection and constant practice. And as well, I guess, even after you've, the real teaching may actually begin after you've attained maybe a certain level, because that's where you truly go deeply into it. Yes. And you're going to find out so much more, because as well, if you're teaching, you're getting regular feedback from students or people you're speaking with. Yes. And that is um, a great, you're, so you're always learning in that learning space. Yeah. So like, before, I would never have thought of myself as a teacher, but now it makes so much sense because I'm able to talk about it, as you say, with my students. We are able to process it. And in that group space, you can come up with so much more ideas and understanding where if it is just you alone reflecting and working on it, it can you can make leaps and bounds when you have that group energy as compared to if you alone are just plodding along. <laughs> I mean, for some, it is that is the way to to work on it individually. But for others, you know, we are a collective. Yeah, and I think because I do a uh, meditation class with three and four year olds. Aww. So I asked one of them, um, what are we doing? And he said, uh, majoration. I he, he got, but he was so correct because what we were doing was a mixture of meditation and imagination. Yes. And this, uh, and I was taught this by a three-year-old. Yes, that is lovely. <laughs> that is lovely. Um, and kids, kids have the, so I've taught some kids. I, I tend to, if you're teaching yoga, if you're doing anything in Trinidad, you have to be able to go for the whole spectrum of, things because there's just not enough to support you financially otherwise right so I've taught kids and I've taught seniors and I've taught everybody every age group kids have their own understanding and joy and they bring to it right um their own wisdom and I think kids because they're close to source right close to spirit as they come up and then as they become older it is to keep them with that understanding and to keep them to have that knowledge that innate wisdom that can be lost when we go into the world of work that kind of thing yeah, i think what you said as well with this dance of life if we can what we call adults if we can dance if we can sing <laughs> if we can create mm -hmm. if we can just play it keeps us in touch with that spirit of source that source spirit is what they call the child mind and maybe realize that we never lost the child mind it's always in us always in just us. covered by layers of uh, ideas <laughs> concepts and thoughts this is what you're supposed to do this is what you're supposed to do but underneath yeah. it we have this playful spirit and we want to play we want to enjoy we want to express come back to joy, right? Because that is what kids express. Um, happy, healthy kids. That is what, you know, joy. So yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask one last thing. It was your 30 day, um, hmm? your 30 days of self care. <laughs> yes, last year. yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Could you go in, into a uh, little bit about that, please? Okay, so last year, I believe it was me. Um, I did a 30 days of self-care practice and that was to share with persons online. Um, and I think that I, one of the ways that I connect to spirit is through cards, through Oracle, through decks, right? So I have a, an Oracle deck called the Self-Care Oracle. And every day I would choose a card and do the activity, right? 
And it brings you, because I think so much now we think about self-care as something outside of ourselves. There's a self-care industry of all of these things, right? But self-care is inherent. How do we, how do we, we don't necessarily need all of these things, but when we come back to ourselves, when we look at our practices, it is self-care, it is taking care of ourselves. Um, and if we practice things like yoga, things like meditation, if we live a spiritual life, then this is all recognizing that everything we do is part of our self-care. Everything we do is, is building ourselves and building our practice. And so it was my hope that in doing that 50 day thing, um, and it, it worked out pretty okay with the ones who were doing it, you know, that they could see that every little thing, drinking a cup of tea, you take that moment to pause, you take that moment to connect with the warmth of the tea, the origin, how it feels inside your body, what response comes up, what sense memory, what, you know, all of these things from one cup of tea, right? Um, things like taking a walk, you connect with nature, you connect with that spirit of the world around us, you notice change and the cycles, right? And this is all part of our practice and this is all self-care, they're one and the same. And so it's been interesting to see this self-care industry, how it has, and everyone who speaks about it and talks about it and that kind of thing when it is something that, you know, our ancestors knew how to do innately, that these are all practices that we are given, that we, that our ancestors have um, developed and worked with over years upon years upon years upon, you know, things like creating, like making time to do art, making time to, um, you know, just connect with with what, how you express yourself, because we all have our ways. If we look at this painting here, it's by a local artist, um, and she's amazing, watercolor. This star here is by another local one who is connecting to weaving and making making um, the baskets and weaving wreaths and that kind of thing. And so it's interesting to recognize, and it is important to recognize that self-care is not necessarily something <clears throat> set apart. It's not something that, you know, oh, we have to learn how to do self-care. I have to get these things. But it is taking the time and bringing in the awareness to do the things that come to us, that the practices that have been handed down to us, move your body, <laughs> you know, these kinds of things, that yoga and self-care are one and the same which is something that I know people who are not yoga fans might be like, oh, self-care is not yoga. But what is yoga? Yoga is building this awareness of self. Yoga is connecting to your truth. Yoga is, you know, just finding who you are, what you are about. And self-care is all of this as well, connecting to what, what is best for me taking time to pause and take a nap, taking time to, you know, just read or, uh, or find things that are inspiring or whatever. So yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I have lots of thoughts on it. <laughs> Renee, I think we'll leave it then. It's been absolutely wonderful to speak with you today. So Good. thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me. It was lovely. <laughs> well, this has been a Ranusha's conversation on the spiritual journey with Renee. Renee, I will leave a link to your site on the bottom of this when I when I post it. Thank you. Um, because just to say on my YouTube channel, I will be sharing a couple of Shea yoga videos. Um, and that's because of my seniors. As I said earlier, you know, I'm trying to still connect with them, even though we're in a pandemic. So there will be some Shea yoga videos up on that as well. And uh, thank you from my mum who did your one with the chair. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So this has been a Ranusha's conversation on the spiritual journey with Renee. Thank you very much. And I'll see you soon. <laughs>